So we have some really exciting things to share, Thomas, don't we? Sure do. Sure do today. Thomas is uh, a key person on the Auto Trader team focusing on business development and insights to data. And I met Thomas uh, because my customers were asking me, Brian, what is the role of AutoTrader, Cars.com, these third-party classified sites? Are they good for my business? Do I need to have them? And I wasn't getting clear answers, and I ran into and, Thomas. And wait, wait, wait. Um, before we even start, actually, notice that we're on opposite sides of the stage, so we really don't get along very well. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> and Thomas said, Brian, AutoTrader wants to be more transparent. If you're telling me that dealers really want to know what the value is, I'll work with you. Now, it took about a year, right, to no. get, yep. get everything together. That's right. So it took a year through the lawyers mm -hmm. and all that legal review because I had to look at shared data between you know, my clients and that use trader. But for the first time, we have I, what I believe is really groundbreaking data to share with you to help you understand the role of third-party uh, classified sites and more importantly, what we're calling the digital ups and clips. And I couldn't be more excited, to, Thomas, to be presenting yeah. with you today. Thanks. So kick uh, things off. Probably about uh, oh, four years ago, to, uh, it was the end of 2008, I was asked by a large dealer group to help with a coordinated and integrated advertising campaign. And it was coordinated because we were trying to show the same message across multiple media. And it was integrated because we wanted to determine whether the w impacts of various uh, marketing channels were effective or not. And so it was kind of groundbreaking work that we were doing then because we were able to put audience tracking on multiple websites. We put cookie tra uh, tags into uh, display advertising. We were one of the first folks to actually start to uh, play around with uh, Google SEM um, at that stage. And even on their radio spots, we actually did fun things like we said, instead of go to www.dealername.com, we actually said, Google dealer name tent sale. And we brought it all together, but you know, trying to put this type of message and pull it off quickly takes a lot of effort. So Brian and I, even though we were kind of on a little bit of opposite sides of the stage and things, we said, well, I need your help. And what we learned, it worked, but what we learned that day that time changed the course of our relationship as well as where we focused our time from there on after. And so we came up with some new terms that will become in the lexicon of dealers' minds forever. Right? I hope so. Oh, I hope so. So and um, actually, it started out with the o o Obama uh, thing in the politics. I was listening to the physical clip, and I said, hey, there's something to be learned right there. I can apply that to the dealership. I'm That's sorry, right. So we said so digital cliff, cliff was the start of it. Digital cliff. This would be a good acronym. So we yeah. have some new terms. I'm not going to read the definition, but a digital up, the digital cliff, the digital blind spot, the digital path, and the digital slide rule, and very much to your interest, I believe is understanding this digital blind spot because in the workshops I've been doing over and over again, dealers are struggling to use their analytics and vendors reports to make business decisions and there's some blind spots. They can't make the right decisions because they only have a partial view and that's why we started to work together. So yep. let me uh, ask Thomas to start talking about the digital path. Yeah, let's path. talk about the digital path. So do we all really have a clear picture of what is driving traffic to your showroom and specifically to your dealer website? <laughs> and every one of you have to answer no, because even a company like myself, even Chris uh, talking about the dealer analytics that he's doing great work earlier today, really we don't have a clear path. But if we look back you know, a couple years, we used to think that the process for buying a car was very, very linear. linear. People would go to one website, then they'd do another activity, they'd go to the manufacturer's website, and magically they would buy a car. And somehow, I think we called that the funnel at the time. That's right, the yeah. digital sales funnel. But all of us know that shopping is no funnel. 
There's no two paths the same. Consumers are spending an enormous amount of their time online researching cars and they're hopping between uh, various websites. And so this is actually more of a picture of what the consumer experience is like today, that they have a series of activities that they're performing and they're generally using Google search to get between those different islands of activity. They spend time uh, first researching a car and then moving on uh, through. And it's this digital tracking that we're gonna be talking about today, path analysis, that helps us actually paint a better picture uh, there. And, and basically we all know the evolution uh, of some of this call tracking, then into website analytics. There's been a lot of focus over the last few years on CRM and CRM utilization. And this whole evolution of attribution and tracking the consumer is, Brian, we need to sell more cars. The market's changing. What are the tools to do it? And for the first time, and it really tailors into Chris Reed's uh, research at Cobalt, this idea of digital audience tracking, some of the bigger players who have reached the technology and the analyst are bringing great insights to you to apply it uh, at the dealership to sell more cars. So how does it all work? First of all, we're starting out with being able to follow and ta put place tags onto various websites and follow a consumer going across not only within our own website, but across multiple websites, provided we actually have certain tags in place. And we're actually able to do that without impinging on a personally identifiable information. We're um, very uh, uh, taking the high road in the PII space. And so this digital tracking, what it allows you to do is stitch a bunch of activities together that the consumer is performing across multiple websites and turn them into a garden path that are seamless in nature. And we're doing that with uh, the uh, time stamping all the way through. And so what you can do is start to actually look at what are the activities that are occurring for the shopper. And I'm gonna start out with a very simple example of somebody that wants a Ford Edge. And this is real data, by the way, that I'm showing. It's not illustrative at all. Where the consumer starts out on Kelly Blue Book, they look at uh, quite a few uh, different competing small SUVs on Auto Trader. They go back over to, uh, to Kelly Blue Book. They do a little more research there. They use uh, Google Paid to get to the dealer's website. They look at a Ford Edge. They come back to Auto Trader, look at a few more Ford Edges, and they buy a Ford Edge. And there's some little technology that we use actually to know that this path ended in a purchase. So this seems like a pretty simple path. Um, what about this one? <laughs> this is much, much more representative. Consumers are spending enormous amounts of time online comparing makes and models and cars. And you may ask, well, why? And it's because there's so many choices available. And in fact, there's so many choices available they don't necessarily know all the options that they have available at first. And Chris will tell you that their, their path and uh, their consideration set may start out very narrow, and all of a sudden it broadens out quite a bit, and then it comes back into focus near the end of the shopping process. And Chris told you, and we confirm this, that the single best way to predict sales or consumers actually wanting to buy a car is how many times they look at the same DDP uh, of the same car. Doesn't mean that that's one they bought, for the same car, so but it's still a pretty complicated path, Brian. And it looks like, from what I'm seeing here, this one shopper looked at 13 different makes, 23 different models, over across what you could see. Mm -hmm. And want to be clear, we can't see if they, were, if they were looking at other third-party classified sites. This is just between these three. So think about this if you added cars.com, if you added the OEM's site, Really, how much activity, what vehicles, models, consideration set is there? I think Chris was mentioning 500 different uh, impressions and interactions. I mean, there's a lot going on today during that consumer shopping cycle. Mm -hmm. And other examples you can look at, and by the way, these examples, there's no two alike, but there's millions and millions of people that are doing the same type of activity. So here's another more. Uh, detailed example showing exactly what type of pages that consumer was on. Uh, this consumer was trading in a 2005 Nissan Altima. We know that because of the activity that they did on Kelly Blue Book. Uh, they did research. 
And what's interesting about this, and it's very typical of what we see today, is that the very first time that they've gone into the dealer's website, they're navigating to the dealer's website through paid search. In fact, what they're looking at, do, they're doing, is using the brand name type of keywords that you pay for in paid search. The second time, they're using organic. And the third time, guess what? The browser has remembered your, the URL string, so it's faster for them actually to get to the URL on the third or fourth and subsequent visits. And this is a very typical pattern that we're seeing as consumers start to navigate to your website. And so, Thomas, I just want to be clear because there's some people in this room that look at their Google Analytics. Are you saying that some of the visits that are being registered as direct or as organic were actually influenced because of a third-party classifier? If I say yes, am I booed off stage yet? No, oh, no, okay. not at all, not at all. <laughs> all right. Because we need to get to the truth of how we can attribute our marketing investments. Yep. And here's, here's uh, another example Thomas can yep. walk us it's through. It's actually a clearer example, and you're going to have to click through it. So yeah. we quite often will see across all these various websites that a, a consumer may start out with trying to figure out what their current car is worth. They'll go to evaluation websites. They'll start to do research on cars. They'll actually go to classified websites and look at their same car to see it what other ones are uh, being sold for in the marketplace. They do a lot of shopping and comparison on sites like Autotrader, and then they'll start u bouncing into the dealer's website for very short durations to use either uh, looking at the reviews as well as um, just the direct navigation within search um, to get to the dealer website. They go bouncing back into Autotrader, make sure that they're right, and you know you really got them when they're back, so actually the day of the sale, they're back on Kelly Blue Book, and they're researching, trying to become more knowledgeable about the car they intend to buy than the sales rep. And then finally, they go through the offline transaction of buying the car. And so what we're able to do is put a final little tracking code into the outbound email that gets sent to the consumer after the sale that allows us to trace this whole conversation back. And so we've done this with millions of uh, purchases. So this pattern actually becomes very, very clear. So let's go back then to this uh, consumer journey here. This is uh, quite um, uh, a mess. Uh, uh, quite a mess. And so it's uh, actually also a lot of data too, isn't it? So what's going through the consumer's mind that's generating that type of uh, yeah, so search let's, behavior? Let's actually uh, bring this back to earth and put a real person on stage. Okay, oops. oops. What, you know what we forgot to do, Thomas? We forgot to mic it. We forgot to mic it, hold on. No, um, we have a mic cord here. Hmm. I'm pretty sure we do. Do we have, do, audio team, do we have a, a input jack up here? Okay, so then let's just mic it up here. I love ad-libbing. Okay, let's do it. When we were looking at cars, we went through a number of vehicle choices. And the more research that we did, the more things told us that maybe something else was a better option. We started with a Ford Focus, we went through an Elantra, we went through a number of cars before we completely threw out our original criteria and started over again and went with, we were looking for hybrids. The biggest changing point was when we had come very close to buying the Prius. We um, were very close, we were settled on that car and then we went home and I started thinking, maybe I'm not. Maybe my problem is I'm too tied into the idea of a brand new car. I went to Auto Trader and, and I just searched used hybrids. And I came up with, there was a couple of Lexuses, not the CT, but similar kind, kind of car we were looking at. And then I saw the Ford Fusion Hybrid. And I turned to my husband and I said, why haven't we looked at the Ford Fusion Hybrid? I, this had not occurred to us at all. And it was because I saw a used one on Auto Trader. And then I thought, well, we haven't looked at this at all. It might be correct price range if we looked at a new one. And that's what we did is we got from this used car search for a car that had never occurred to us at all and found one, um, did the search for what's available nearby at the dealership two miles from my house. They would gotten two in that morning. Went, test drove in, and drove away with the car. <laughs> the Fords actually are really nice cars, which I don't think I'd realize that. <laughs> this type of behavior is happening over and over again. And this may be, well, Brian, yeah, I'm kind of aware of that. What's the actionable data? Well, 
it's really important for you to know tactically what's influencing car sales, how open-minded the consumer is, and what tools you have to get your cars in front of those in-market shoppers that are making a lot of choices. And the data that we're going to show you today is really vital to your marketing decisions. Yep. But in our example, Stephanie, if you listen well, she considered new and used cars. She considered luxury and non-luxury. She considered foreign and domestic. Dealer inventory was important, and proximity was important to her. So all these things get factored in when they're actually online looking for a car. And again, millions of people, just like Stephanie, do this every day. So when you, you start to look at your data, realize actually there's a person on the other side of that data, and they're doing things just like this. And the whole reason why I partner with Auto Trader, as I mentioned earlier, is when I go into a dealership looking at their budget and I, I identify opportunities, it's very often that I might say you need to do some paid search or do some retargeting or do some video pre-roll or have you tried XYZ? And then it's pretty inevitable that somewhere in the conversation, they're like, well, Brian, if I do all these things, can I cancel autotradercars.com? Have you ever thought that? Raise your hand. Of course you have. And so I said, Thomas, listen, you can show me all of this stuff, but I want you to use customers that I'm working with. I want to know specifically, I want to need to look at it, and you show me the traffic on Trader, the influence on my local dealership, and if I give you the DMS data, can we see how that relates to sales? And here was the big aha moment. Across all of Trader's test studies on this particular topic, not just mine, across a very large audience, 40% of the monthly visitors to your website are on Trader or Kelly Blue Book. That's huge. Now you may say, Brian, I'm not seeing that in Google Analytics. Just hold that thought a moment. Hold that thought because we're going to talk about that in regards to the digital blind spot. So what that means also is that 60% of the customers were not. And those 60% of visitors to your website were on a whole string of different websites. Or they're coming to your website looking at parts and service. And what we're going to do is start to quantify that to give you some rough numbers of where that sits. And in your conference book, a published auto trader study is in your book. Uh, Thomas submitted that. So you can read the larger study that Auto Trader has done to try to answer the question, what's the role of third party classifieds? But today, I'm going to show you exactly, for one of our larger clients, what specifically happened in their market when we looked at audience overlap. And this would, uh, I'd like Thomas to talk a little bit about the digital blind spot. So we have a tendency not to question what we see. Any questions? Yeah, it's going the wrong way. <laughs> and so when it comes to your website analytics, what we see in our analytic reports is that we have traffic coming in through direct, organic, paid search, display advertising, and if we're running um, campaign type of metrics inside the site, we'll also see the OEM traffic coming in or any other campaigns like email. And then also we have our referral traffic coming inbound. So there's basic categories of things filtering into our website. And so what we see in general, and you've, your data may be slightly different, that when you look at the data, the big influence that drives traffic to your website is that direct traffic or this search traffic. Can we agree that it's not autotrader or cars.com? It's invisible, correct? And that causes this question, what am I paying that much per month if the majority of my traffic is organic and direct? Has anybody thought that? Why am I paying them? I don't see that influence on my website, correct? That's why this research mm -hmm. was started and done. So when it actually comes to the analytics and that illusion, I'm going to actually get you to take a leap and we're going to show you some background data uh, in just a few minutes, but are we watching the wrong news channel? Are we getting our information from the wrong source? 
And so from a general standpoint, this is probably very much like most of you that when you look, there's no more than one or two percent of referral traffic coming to your site from Trader, correct? Right? You scratch your head. Is this third party classified really selling me more cars when a large chunk is organic? Other sources, you know, portal sites, uh, local uh, banner advertising, some paid search, and of course, traffic from OEM related activities. So let's actually peel that back a little bit. And <laughs> look, let's look at things on a sunny day. So if we actually look at our inbound uh, referral traffic, it probably looks more like this. You can actually run a report in Google Analytics or DDC or even the Cobalt reports that will uh, measure these things for you. And you'll see that the auto trader, cars.com, admins traffic never really eclipses more than 2% of your inbound traffic, correct? And then so when you really take a look at you know, this pie chart, um, we really have to ask ourselves, what is really influencing these bins or categories? And it's really not very clear until you undertake the actual tagging of consumer behavior on multiple sites. Mm -hmm. So let's actually take a quick look to see what are consumers really doing on a daily basis getting to your website. They get to a VDP page, they hit that search button at the top of the, the, uh, the browser. From the browser, they start to type in the name of the dealership. In this case, I'm using the example of Andy Moore, and they're just typing in a few characters right over there. Instantly, a, as they're typing, the search engine is auto-populating that field. They find the one that they want. They click down two links, and they go to navigate to that page. And again, why are they doing that activity? Just like the camera example, if you're actually out looking for a camera in the retail space, you may actually pick a primary website that you're actually looking at for finding research and information. You open up a second browser window to start to navigate to very specific stores to see do they really have it and what's the price and plus the shipping. Consumers are doing the same activity online for automotive shopping. They stay on a primary portal website like uh, auto trader and then they briefly navigate to the dealer's website by opening up a second window. They prefer to do that typing in versus pushing in on the link because they don't want to lose context. And to tell you the truth, when I first heard Chip tell me that, when I saw him speak, I'm like, I don't believe it. Because if a dealer's, think about it, I don't know, maybe you thought the same way, is, is Auto Trader or other classifieds just lying to us, honestly, you know, about their influence because you say, I just want to see referral traffic, I want to see leads, and of course, if your influence is dying down, wouldn't you say that they're not doing it? You know, mm -hmm. and it was like until Thomas said, no, we're willing to be transparent, give us clients that you work with, we'll tag them, we'll show the experience, and I thought that was quite brave, mm -hmm. but it was because of their confidence. Yep. And here's another example. Yep, so in a typical scenario, what we see in our metrics is somebody going to Google, they're searching for a car, and they'll either be doing brand name keywords or some sort of shopping term, we'll cover that in a minute. They drive to the dealer website, and that activity is going to be recorded into your Google Analytics or your dealer website analytics. But if the same consumer had been on Auto Trader first, opens up a second browser window, then goes to search, finds what they want, looks at the reputation, then goes immediately to the dealer website, that will never appear in your Google Analytics. It's impossible for that to happen, even if the consumer is using multi channel analytics. And so, visitors in website analytics are not from where they appear. I need you to leave this conference with this ingrained in your mind. Google Analytics is really good for certain things, but it does not have the full view of the consumer experience. The data that Chris Reed showed previous this morning is because they have the tagging and network. Same with AutoTrader. These tagging insights show a larger picture, but neither Chris, as Chris admitted, or Thomas have the full picture. 
but what a rich picture when you start to tap in and reveal that you cannot use Google Analytics as your benchmark for ROI. You are missing too much of the interaction. And there are some vendors that you can visit during NADA that actually can provide and paint part of this story for you independently. So let's jump then. If this is what's happening, what is the role of search? What did the research tell us, Thomas, of Google, in particular's role in the consumer shopping experience? So what we think your, um, your own analytics will back this up, but for the most part, you can add up either your paid and your organic uh, traffic, and it should add up to about 50% of your inbound traffic. So the implication would be then that these consumers are using Google to get to your uh, various websites. So there was a portion of it that actually is devoted to referral traffic, and on a sunny day, maybe Auto Trader is 1% or 2% of that uh, makeup right here. So if we're telling you right off the bat that 40% of the visitors to your website had been on AutoTrader, well, which part of the pie are they coming in from? And that's what we're going to cover next. Right, because you understand you can't see it now, right? Are we clear? You go to Google Analytics and you see 1% of referral traffic and you stand up and we're telling you 40% on average across the country, over thousands of websites were on AutoTrader first. And you, you have to understand why you're not seeing it and then where is it actually showing up in the state of study? So you start to peel back the onion a little bit by looking at all the keywords that are coming into your website. And in any of your analytics systems, you should be able to parse through and take a quick look at all the inbound keywords that are being used in your website. And you can break them up in really two or three categories. One's for parts and service, but as far as shopping for cars, it really is, are the, is the consumer using your brand name or are they using shopping terms uh, to get to your website? Classify them into those two categories. And just recently, I was talking with an uh, Orlando dealer, mm -hmm. and we looked at their paid search. Now, they were spending north of 10000 a month, mm -hmm. and over $5,000 was specifically on these type of brand name searches, their name, name, and attempts. Well, let's actually talk about what that really means. A brand name keyword is one like that finds your name, like World Toyota or Sam Slope Honda, Andy Moore is going to be in there. A shopping term is more about a year make model or some sort of regional term or used cars in Salt Lake. And the difference actually between these two types of terms usage by consumers, and we see this in the digital tracking, is that they generally on the left side, my left side, the I know where I want to go, brand type of words, they were generally influenced by some of their stimulus before getting to your dealer website. Now the good news is even if these consumers are coming in from sites like AutoTrader first, the good news is those type of keywords, if you're buying them on your SEM campaigns, are dirt cheap. On the other hand, the shopping terms that are coming in bound to your website is the other side, and those tend to be incremental shoppers come to your website, but they tend to be a lot more expensive on the SEM side. So, so Thomas, we see then from this data that 65% of consumers are using some form of the dealership name in search. Why is that the case? Um, they, <laughs> it's actually the influence of sites like AutoTrader and Cars.com beforehand. And the data proves that you can actually track the consumers going between these uh, various activities. So then, so what for you, what, 40 percent. Mm -hmm. 40% of these shoppers are coming in from sites like AutoTrader landing on the dealer website. And guess what? 70% of the time, those consumers are using search to get from point A to B. It, it's almost, in some that's, respects... That's across millions of visits. We're seeing right. that. It, it's almost like Google acts for this type of scenario, like the yellow pages. A quick way... I, I wouldn't say that, but you could. A quick way to jump. If you think about it, when I bought a sit-stand desk, Thomas referred to what he's seeing over thousands and millions of interactions, but I recently bought a sit-stand desk, and it's a German manufacturer, and it had a funky name with a funky model number, but it was beautiful. 
When I found that desk, I kept that page there, opened up another browser, copied the name of the desk and the model number, searched, ended up finding the desk at Sam Flax North, um, shopped three or four different uh, supply houses that had this desk. They had the best deal, the best shipping. That's where I bought it. And the reason why I bring this up is that if you would have, if, if the companies that were selling that product looked at the influence on what brought them, they would not have attributed it to the, the manufacturer's site because I opened up that second window. When you have this unique data warehouse and seeing all these transactions, it makes a lot of sense because dealers ask me, Brian, how, how come I'm spending so much money on Google paid search on my name? Have you ever looked at your Google paid search? is the number one keyword that you're spending money on your dealership name? Yes? Which is okay. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's inexpensive. But it's consistent with what's happening. They start to type the name, and if you're buying your name, the first thing is your dealership's pay-per-click ad. Their goal is just to get to the site to confirm that that same vehicle they saw on Trader is available on your site. One thing that I want to be very clear is we're too close to it to see it, but would you agree with me that the consumer has no clear way of understanding that the price in car and auto trader is most likely the same price in car on your website? They do not understand that we ship inventory to trader every day. You understand? You understand that they just see this third party site, it's a vehicle with a price. Can you understand why they're human nature, they don't know it, why they would go to your site and see if it's there? and see if it's the same price and the same car. You get it? We had a guess that this was happening before. Now we have it for sure. So let's go back to I wanted, um, uh, Ford Edge again. In that earlier example, that consumer actually navigated to the dealer's website by paid. And that's actually the typical approach. Again, paid normally comes first. Second visit, they seem to hit organic. And third visit, they're starting to direct. So probably a better way of painting this picture is to start to split it up a little bit, and Brian. Yeah, so and, you. Um, yeah. Next slide. Um, there you go. So, a better way of splitting it up would be to start to look at your, your analytics and say, well, how many of your shoppers, regardless of whether they're coming in through paid or organic, how many of them are using brand name keywords to get to your nat, uh, website, and other um, visitors are using shop, shopping type of terms? And recognize, again, that 70% of, of visitors coming in from third-party classified websites are navigating to your website by way of search. So I want you to think of search as a very short taxi ride. I, I don't mean it to diminish that. Um, I, I love using taxis up in, uh, in New York. But we can break it up into really three categories of search terms coming into your website. A brand name, t uh, brand name type of terms, they are a very low cost type of way of a consumer getting into your website. And you want to actually have those placements in search because you don't, if your competitor down the road is actually buying your, your brand name your keyword, you need to actually be able to spend this money as a defensive move. Shopping terms are much more expensive. They're running maybe about $35 per conversion on your website. But they are bringing in an incremental shopper to your website. And then the last category of search type of terms are service-based ones. And they tend to actually, on your SEM, start to cost in a, a midpoint uh, range. All these things are very effective, but now actually seeing how they all stitch together is also very important too. So are we clear before we move on to the next definition that just looking at organic brand name, direct referral, or, or uh, uh, direct typing, is significantly underreporting the influence of third party classified. We clear? This is why we have to understand how search is being used, especially for today's car shoppers. So let's move on to Thomas. Yeah, Tell us about um, the digital, digital clip in the So up. Again, actually, digital clip, I thought about it actually with that physical clip. We just don't want to <laughs> go off the edge um, too fast. When it comes to actually the marketing, there's a, a very simple strategy that you all uh, play. You want people to be exposed to your brand. You want them engaging with your brand. And then finally, the last act is you want them interacting. And interacting is 
phone calls and emails. And the, your goal as a marketer is actually to try to reduce that climb that they're doing as, as, as small as possible. So if you're going to be very effective if you're 100% of people exposed to your brand are engaging and interacting with you. You know that's not really not the case. So let's actually look at some examples of what's really happening on your website. But first, there's two parts that peop, uh, visitors die off. When they're on a site like AutoTrader, it's between the search result page and the BDP page. First, you have to actually get consumers interested in the right type of cars on your website, and that you, you do that by selecting the right inventory to get them on SRP pages. But then there's a transition point of getting them to actually look at real cars and uh, BDPs. And merchandising, pricing, photos all play into that conversion process. The second uh, uh, cliff that occurs is on the dealer website, navigating from the home page down to the BDP page. And I think Chris will actually back this up that with his heat maps that he was showing on our dealer website is that we actually have a lot of clutter on our website and we're not driving visitors down into meaningful engagements on our website. So if we peel back the onion again on looking at how many shoppers that are going to your website are actually looking at um, inventory looking at cars and showing that they are really are in market to buy a car, never mind actually were they looking at used and new, there's a, quite a bit of a drop off. And part of that drop off is caused by people coming to the website just to look for the phone number for parts and service, right? But it, that's only about 20, uh, 20 or so percent of the visitors to your website. So most dealerships that we see, the average is about 63% of people that are coming to your website are actually really looking at cars. Tomorrow we're gonna give you, uh, if you're interested, I have a workshop that um, will show you specifically how you can actually measure this yourself. Now what we do is we contrast that to the auto trader the visitor coming to the website. Right, and what we're seeing is the auto trader visitor, and there's that 38 or 40% audience overlap, it's much more targeted or pre-filtered traffic. Matter of fact, we were taking a look uh, just today in the analytics class, and I, we couldn't even have paid for it, is that we pulled up someone's analytics randomly, we were looking at, we did a segment overlay of which sources uh, viewed inventory, and there was zero bounce rate from the auto trader referral traffic. Meaning, the auto trader 38 or 40% comes in, most of them are coming into your site to look at inventory. So we have a highly qualified visitor, coming into your website, and I want to be very clear about what Thomas said. If you take away from Chris Reed's presentation this one thing, is that we need to start keeping our eyeballs focused on VDP views per month, we should be having a discussion at our dealership with our agencies, with our website design teams on what could we do on the home page to stop that cliff from happening, meaning people who are coming to our website that should be looking at inventory, how do we get them in inventory? The reason why we showed this slide is not just that AutoTrader has a high audience overlap. When they get through that shopping process and come to your website, they're highly qualified to do the exact behavior that Chris's data showed, and of course Thomas's mm -hmm. data is going to show in a minute that that is going to correlate to a qualified activity that results in a sale. Mm -hmm. So a quick summary on it. On the third party uh, website to avoid that digital cliff is pick the right cars, i.e. increase search result page views, and merchandise the car through more BDPs with the first 72 characters really do matter. Put your attention and custom comments in those first 72 characters. Transparent pricing for new and used cars, and of course having uh, great photos for both new and used cars. What's an interesting point here is that we see in the data that consumers will spend an enormous amount of time looking at nearly new, nearly new used cars on our website. But that doesn't mean that they're necessarily a used car shopper. There are not enough pictures and descriptions out there, some of you are great at this, but on the new car side. And so what we'll see is that a consumer that may have been looking at used cars on AutoTrader, the moment they get to the dealer's website, they're actually looking at new cars. 
because they're then looking at the incentives. In fact, 44% of our visitors actually wind up looking at new cars on your website once they get there. And as I mentioned, avoiding the digital cliff from the website, will you make a commitment to leave here taking the data that was shared this morning with Chris and the data from real clients that I share? Are you going to get serious about merchandising your website to increase the VDP views? Are you going to declutter, focus, drive, and more importantly, experiment and test with the designs that increase the behavior that big data research is showing to sell more cars? And so if you instrument your analytics correctly, you can actually start to see what the trends are over time. You can actually look at in this uh, specific chart, um, just a click, you can actually see in-market shoppers, new shoppers, and used car shoppers, and what those ratios are over time. And so if you record when you're actually making changes to your advertising or strategy or merchandising or site design, you can see it. Tomorrow I'm going to show an example of, a uh, of one dealership that uh, made a significant change on the website and actually flopped. You can see it in measuring these uh, ratios and it translates into the ratios um, related to sales. So we've been talking about actually the VDP views and saying that they're important, but why are they important and let's prove it. So the research that we did together, and of course it's corroborated with what Chris uh, had presented, and, and the funny thing is these two presentations were not timed. Uh, Chris and I uh, did not discuss each other's no, uh, presentation, never. or ne neither show independently now from the huge data warehouse that Cobalt has and the huge data warehouse that AutoTrader is that this idea of VDPs and sales are highly correlated. And I go back to the comment that someone made earlier. It's like, Brian, we get 5,000, 7,000, 10,000 people visiting our website. I want to market to these people. I really want to uh, sell more cars, but only a fraction of them are giving us our emails and calling us. Great, but now this data is telling us one other thing. If we're doing the right thing with our marketing budget, that VDP view should be increasing if we're doing things right. And if we do, it will directly correlate to sales and it applies to Highline and to import. Thomas, explain the difference in, so, in the shared research that we did between these two brands. So we looked at data for sales and VDPs and we cross-correlated not only VDPs on the dealer's website, visits to the dealer website to sales, as well as uh, VDPs on AutoTrader. And you pick your metric and everything else, just stick with it, it works. But what's gonna happen is your situation is gonna be different from another franchise or independent store in the marketplace. The data showed us very clearly that it takes more VDPs to sell a BMW than it does a Honda. It's curved, it's still predictable, but it's actually at a different rate. And why is that? Actually, I don't know for sure, but my assumption would be that BMW buyers are more finicky or uh, more selective in their, in their buying process. And so basically over a large picture, and this is not just one client, but the studies of that auto traders doing globally outside of the uh, case study that we worked on, that the VDP heat map really overlap quite nicely with the sales heat map. And mm -hmm. this is part of this whole global research that you can't see. The digital blind spot has made you think that sites like cars.com and Auto Trader were expensive. But really the challenge I have for you today is to really ask yourself this, how well is your marketing budget, that 50, 75, hundred thousand dollars a month, that you're spending to drive traffic to your website, how well is that working to generate VDPs? And are you willing to hold yourself, your marketing agency, your digital team accountable to the same metric that you hold cars.com and AutoTrader to is, how come my cost per VDP is so high? You may be shocked to see what your own cost per VDP is because you are investing in marketing strategies that are not aligned with Chris's research, with Auto Trader's research, that if unless you're moving the needle on VDP views, either off-site or on-site, and hopefully on both, you're missing 
the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So if you notice actually on the previous slide, there may have been a small little black dot right over there. That was a store location. And around that actually was where all the sales were coming from, as well as all the BDPs. And there's very close correlation. So this slide breaks it down into like more of a linear format where we were trying to show, well, here's the distance the consumer was from the store when they bought the car. So sales is one axis. And when in the line, we actually showed where the BDPs are occurring. And so overall, 14% of total sales are from greater than 60 miles from th this series of stores. And 24% of the VDPs are from 60 miles from the store. What's interesting about this statistic is that the 60 mile mark is out really outside the range of traditional advertising. So what that's saying is at least 15% or so of your sales are being generated from online advertising. And they're certainly not doing it from your dealer website. They're being exposed and influenced by sites and the advertising that you do on third-party classified websites. And, and to tie that uh, in, in just one specific example, those of you who are using Google AdWords, right, what is your radius? 30 miles, 40 miles. What Thomas's point is, is that not only is there correlation, but there's actual geographic data to support that if your advertising radius is 30 or 40 miles, all of those sales that are past that marketing range really need to be attributed some way, and we're seeing that through this study. Yeah, here's another example. This was um, of seven stores uh, located uh, north of us a bit. And again, a very nice tight correlation between uh, where the sales and the VDPs are coming from. Um, if you were a wizard, you would say, oh, what's the R squared on that? And you'd say, oh, the R squared is about um, 0.65 or something like that. Pretty good correlation. So what this data is starting to show us is more visits, more activity that's occurring on AutoTrader translates into more visits to your dealer websites. That's a guarantee. What we're also showing is that more visits to your homepage does not necessarily translate into more sales. You could be driving a lot of unqualified traffic to your dealer, uh, dealer website, or else also you have the parts and service uh, part of the component mixed into it. And and I just want to comment, and I've said it a couple times today in workshops, we have to stop looking at the total visits to the website. And we also have to start looking at our referral, our advertising sources as they generate VDP views. Just looking at a number, like a bounce rate of X, or I got 5,000 visitors, and going to you know, a meeting and saying, well, what, what will you get? How many visitors you got? How many visitors? That has nothing we need to be focused on the behavior, the VDP view behavior that is correlated with sales. But what is correlated, again, is VDPs to sales. Try it. Try it in your own store. But the interesting thing is that there's a wide range of performance of dealers trying to get people to look at cars. So I'd rather actually see, uh, be the, con the dealership that actually is generating a high number of VDPs per car because I'm actually going to be outselling my competitor. And this comes down to why you're here. You are going to learn new strategies and processes that will help align your budgets where consumers are searching and to merchandise your inventory and to present in such a way that those VDP views per visit will increase. And if that happens because you've taken this strategy, you've realigned your budgets, you're taking this research back to you, you'll be on the left side of the chart. That's correct. And so we all know what the up is. Somebody getting up from their desk. Yep. I want you to actually think about the digital up. And so we've been, we have a focus of actually looking at emails and phone calls as the only means of being able to predict performance of your advertising. Today, I want you to start thinking about the digital up. And this digital up is the person who's not necessarily submitting a lead or calling you, as Lisa Murray had, you know, had said, hey, Brian, hey, where are all these other people? But if we can understand that the digital up is correlating to a behavior, a way to measure uh, the effectiveness of advertising, we're onto something. Yep. So let's talk about measurement. Exactly. So we've done probably about 200,000 sourcing studies where we use an independent uh, party to call consumers up after a sale. 
and some neat statistics come out of it. In fact, the ratios from those studies actually very much mirror what we're finding in the digital sourcing studies. And the key findings there, over 200,000 interviews with consumers, is did they actually email or phone the dealership in advance? And you know, bottom line is 70% of, of consumers walk right in the door. They don't even try to contact the, the dealership. That's right, and, and of course, it's, there's a lot of focus on email handling and leads, and that's really important. Uh, Joe Webb's here, did a workshop on lead handling. I think Mark McGurn is ale. But as you look at the percentage of what that relates to as far as percentage of your car sales, it, it is not the majority, and so we need to be looking at the bigger picture as well. Mm -hmm. So what did we find from our study? working together, so we picked uh, some large uh, groups and some smaller groups, and the kind of eye-opening metrics, and I'll be presenting after today the research to our individual clients so they'll know, is that this 40% overlap is real. More importantly, take a look at this, 34% visited ATC or KBB first. And those of you who are understanding this concept of exposing your inventory to dealers, I mean to in-market uh, in consumers, and this type of reach, you need to ask yourself, have I been kicking the wrong dog? Have I been blaming the wrong merchandising partner for success? And, and Thomas, tell us a little bit about what this slide is telling us as, as far as uh, timeshare allocation. Well, it's kind of complicated slide, but of the 40% of the visitors that actually do go, go to your website across our study, what we found is that 60% of their time is actually spent on a third-party classified website. 22% on Kelly Blue Book, and only 18% is actually on your dealer website. This is why it's very important that when you get a qualified visitor into your website, you need to actually drive them to action and look at cars. It's predictable that if you get people to look at cars, they buy cars. And uh, well, thank you for buying it. Sure. Here's some of the other things that were really cool about this study, and this is the first time some of these statistics have been shared. What about bounce rate? People who were in this audience overlap, um, on average, bounce 12%, a regular visitor, 34%. Takeaway. Auto Trader is a pre-filter of bringing qualified traffic to your website. Viewed inventory, 80% of the overlap came to the dealer's website to do inventory. On average, the person who was not was 62%. So they're more engaging. Number of pages viewed, 17 versus 11. People who were on Auto Trader engaged more with the dealer as compared to those who did not. And time on site, 10 minutes, 10 seconds versus five. Think about what this data is telling us. Not only have you not been able to see this 40% audience overlap, and listen, 34% first time they were on AutoTrader, that's how they found your inventory and brand. But for the first time, you can actually see, because of the tagging, that when they come to your website, they're a better shopper they're doing more of the things that research is showing that there'll be a buyer of cars in your market. And, and Thomas, this was a wild one for some, some recent data that we just stuck in yesterday um, mm -hmm. from this audience analysis. So we did a partnership with our good friends over at Datium as part of our study. And what we asked them to do was look at the lead submittal rates of consumers that had been on AutoTrader first and going into the dealer website. And it was really interesting, it, it blew my mind that on average, 45% of the email leads that were being submitted within the dealer website, the consumer had been on AutoTrader immediately beforehand. Now, there was a range in performance, but the average was 45%. Some stores that even have, um, actually that had the highest audience counts were well above uh, 45 and into the 60 percentile range. One of the other things that I'd like to point out on the 70 dealers that were our clients that were allowed into this study is that 
it, we had a 38% overlap, so 2% uh, lower, but within the same range of the larger auto trader. But each one of those dots is a dealer, and you'll see that there's a vertical line associated with these dealers. And Thomas, tell, tell everyone what those vertical lines so mean. What we did was um, our study con was conducted over quite a number of months, and what we did was looked at the audience overlap on a weekly and a monthly basis, and then what we did was average what the audience overlap was over the time period for each dealership. And so what we did find is that the audience overlaps change over time. And there's a few factors that get baked into that, why it changes. Part of it's seasonality. Some shoppers tend to be more in market, in certain part, uh, longer in market in certain times of the year than others. And so they go back and forth into the dealer website and uh, don't convert as much. The product mix within our website partly influences. We actually were able to see some jumps and drops when advertiser, uh, some of these dealerships changed advertising strategies. And there's also a factor of dilution. When a dealership all of a sudden heavily invests in doing SEM that's not converting to in-market shoppers, it tends to dilute the numbers. So there, therefore, there's a range of activity, I mean, reasons why the audience overlaps uh, val vary over time, but for the most part, they're still staying within a very narrow um, band of overlaps and influence. Great, so let's put this all together and just summarize what we know. So first of all, we know that 70, 80% of, of car shoppers are using the internet to research and 67% do not contact the dealership, right? This is the frustrating part. How do I get to the dealers, uh, the consumers that visit my site, don't submit a lead, okay? And we really see it, uh, the internet as an influencing medium, and your takeaway is how do you become VDP factories? How do you syndicate your inventory? You only have two choices to increase your VDPs. Put your inventory on sites that get a lot of traffic or drive more traffic to your website. And that sites like AutoTrader, KBB, and other third-party classifieds give you that reach. The research, and I know it sounds almost promotional, but if you knew me two or three years ago, me standing on stage talking about AutoTrader would be a joke. Because when I first started off, I was the SEO guy and said, man, you don't have to do all those things. SEO you know, is the, the solution. But honestly, and I'll actually I'll go back on that. Actually, uh, many of you may not know that Brian's a mathematician by background. And I was kind of scared. I said, do I really want to do this with Brian? Because he's actually going to be able to dig into the details and find if I've been baking the numbers. But we gave him all the data. And he actually analyzed and questioned every part of actually what we were showing. Oh, yes, we're out nope. of time. We have no nope, more slides. No, nope. hold on. What happened to? Uh, oh. Uh, did the projector die? So we'll animate. <laughs> we only have two minutes left. It's, and we're, it's on okay. a, we're on a summary. Well, that's, that's strange. So the, that was like cosmic. I, you know, the projector died. What? Oh, blackout button. I must have hit the blackout button. Oh. Oh, uh, blackout. There we go. Whew. All right, we're back. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I thought, uh, so I just want to summarize and have Thomas walk through what are six things that you can do to really have success this year. Thomas? So buy and stock the right in-demand vehicles on your website. You'll increase search result pages and put them at the right price. Two, make vehicles stand tall. Merchandise your vehicles. Get your new car photographs done. Get a picture of that radio, Bluetooth and all that stuff. The consumer wants to see it. Three, explain the unique and positive attributes of doing business with your dealership. You're going to actually have to do that not only on sites like AutoTrader, do it on your homepage. If you have a certified or reconditioning program that knocks the socks off, tell the world about it. Focus on your reputation management. Four. You know, and, and one, before I jump to number four, do mm. you know that you could load four videos for every vehicle, right, mm. on AutoTrader? No, it's BDP, a bunch. Right? It's a bunch. So... Why don't you have a stock, why buy from us video? How about a video about your ability to help consumers with finance? And you know, a, a related message about your reviews and ratings. Why wouldn't you have three 
really compelling videos on every VDP on AutoTrader. It doesn't cost you anything, and it really will differentiate yourself. Four, continually fine-tune your dealership website. If you're not experimenting all the time, you're not growing. Experiment, take the metrics that we are describing today of looking at your VDPs to sales ratios. You should be able to see changes in that ratio depending on actually the changes that you're making on your website. Five, manage your reputation. If you manage your reputation, you're accomplishing two things. You're putting a metric in place into your organization that everybody can march to, and you're driving process changes. Simultaneously, you're having a better consumer experience, and related to that, you're also improving what is shown on Google uh, search result pages. Six, define appropriate measures of success. In the past, what we've done is focused on only email and phone, uh, phone type of leads. What we're trying to tell you today, all of us are telling you uh, consistently, is focus on actually also getting BDPs and ra ratioing that over to sales. So now, now, this slide is a little controversial because if you would have asked me to rate the prioritization uh, of what dealers' emphasis should be on their marketing strategy on the left, and I'm let Thomas take care on the right, is that I would have probably three years ago said SEO. And I would have put AutoTrader and Cars.com at the bottom of the list. But what I've found from this audience overlap study and with research that Chris uh, Reed from Cobalt confirmed and the AutoTrader research across thousands of dealer websites, third-party classifieds do a really good job of exposing your inventory, increasing VDP views at a reasonable cost. And I want you to hold yourself accountable then if you think it's expensive to taking your budget and ask yourself, you're a mini auto trader. How well are you generating VDP views on your vehicles for your entire marketing budget that's dedicated to driving traffic? And then working on your dealership website to increase VDP views, working on your reputation and social engagement because you can be taken out of the consideration set very early on if your reviews are horrible. Search engine marketing. Are you maximizing all your digital advertising opportunities? And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have traditional mix like radio TV, but I will tell you is my belief, separate topic, but if you are a cable TV advocate, which is fine, and you're not doing online video, promoted video, video pre-roll, you're missing a huge opportunity. If you believe in newspaper advertising and not doing display or retargeting, you're missing a big opportunity. And here's the key, and Thomas and I discussed this in our workshop, at somewhere between one-tenth to one-twentieth the cost of traditional, if you're not doing the digital analogs to some of the traditional things that have always worked, it is still all about reach and frequency. That's correct. And, and so the study told me that if you're having a conversation in your dealership on who to fire, cars.com or AutoTrader, you're probably kicking the wrong dog. Meaning there's probably a lot of other things that are doing a much horrible job of exposing your inventory and creating VDP views than any of the major third party classified. This is not a pitch for AutoTrader. This is to answer the question that every dealership asks. When can I fire AutoTrader and Cars.com? And the study is you should probably put your first dollars there because your digital literacy at the dealership to run AdWords, digital marketing, SEO is somewhat limited. And so let people who know how to generate the VDP views do it. Then, But, but you're not saying actually increase it, you're just no. saying maximize. Maximize, and that doesn't mean necessarily spend more money, it and means And so part of maximizing, what do we mean by that? You actually have to go to the other side of the fence and look at your operational processes. And are you picking the right inventory? Do you have the tools to pick the right in-demand in uh, vehicles in your marketplace? Are you merchandising your vehicles? Are you spending time and money training your people? It's, it's amazing of all the money you spend on the advertising priority side of this, uh, of this chart, and then we fail actually at the last minute by a guy answering the phone saying, this car is, uh, I sold that car last week, hang up. So if we focus on the training, we actually convert more sales. 
as mentioned just a few minutes ago, if we focus on reputation management as a process and a operational priority, other things change that actually greatly impact the advertising side of it. And finally, putting in great tools for maximizing your connection points for the 30% of the visitors that do interact with you on your website. Well, I couldn't uh, be happier the fact that AutoTrader agreed, after a lot of persuasion, uh, to let me work with a group of dealers to get this answer. Did this data study help you understand the role of third-party classifieds in driving traffic to your website? Get it? Valuable data? Make you change the way you're thinking at how your marketing strategy should be in your local market? Great. Well, I want to thank everyone for their time. We have a short break, and then we kick on to, uh, uh, we, we kind of move right to our last workshops for the day. Thank you so much, and please thank Thomas and for thank his contributions. You.